Hello, and welcome to part three of Arcadia University's uh, histology course uh, lecture series on muscular tissue. And in this mini lecture, we're going to take a look at different types of muscles. Now, the first two lectures focused in primarily on skeletal muscle. And so one thing that we need to do to, to finish up our view of skeletal muscle is to take a look at the connective tissue sheaths uh, associated with it which essentially take our individual muscle fiber, individual muscle cell, and organize it into a gross anatomical muscle. And the nice thing about the skeletal muscle connective tissue sheaths is that they closely parallel what we saw with the connective tissue sheaths of a peripheral nerve. And so we're going to have an endomesium. Uh, the endomesium is essentially a delicate connective tissue sheath, which is going to be surrounding and supporting an individual muscle fiber, individual muscle cell. And so that's similar to what we had with the neuromesium surrounding and supporting uh, the swan cells. We're going to have a perimesium. Uh, a perimesium is going to be a denser connective tissue, which is going to surround and establish a bundle of muscle fibers. And so we're going to have multiple muscle fibers that are all going to be clustered together into what's referred to as a fascicle. And it's going to be these larger connective tissue boundaries uh, of the paramecium, which are going to help delineate the different uh, bundles or fascicles within a muscle. And the paramecium actually acts as septa or walls of that outer layer. That outer layer is going to be a dense connective tissue uh, epimecium, which is going to be uh, essentially surrounding and holding our gross anatomical muscle together. Uh, so we're going to pull together bundles upon bundles of muscle cells together, anchored by the epimesium and ultimately anchored then into uh, the tendons, which are going to be attaching it uh, to whatever its, its insertion and its origin are going to be. Now, when we talk about skeletal muscle, we've talked about how we control muscle contraction. It's important to keep in mind that skeletal, skeletal muscle uh, is going to be undergoing voluntary contraction. And so it's going to be interacting uh, with bones to essentially act as a series of pulleys or levers to allow for quick, forceful movements uh, within the body. And so again, your uh, nervous system is going to trigger those uh, motor neurons. Those motor neurons then are going to send that message out through a peripheral nerve, through that synapse, and cause muscle contraction to occur. Again, under your voluntary control. The next type of muscle we're going to look at is going to be cardiac muscle. And cardiac muscle is going to form a branch network of interwoven muscle fibers uh, within the heart. And so if we take a look at this, the muscle fibers uh, within the heart are actually going to be consisting of many cells. In skeletal muscle, we essentially have the individual cells fused together into a very, very long, unbranched uh, cell, an unbranched fiber. Within cardiac muscle, we're going to have long unbranched cells, but much smaller in relationship to what we had with skeletal muscle. Uh, the cells are going to become branched, uh, but they're going to connect up with neighboring cells to form these long fibers. If we took a look at individual cells themselves, what we're going to have is generally uh, lots of myofilaments within the cell. We're going to have one or two ovoid centrally placed nuclei. And so instead of in a, a, a skeletal uh, muscle where we'd have many nuclei, the nuclei flattened and peripherally located, in cardiac muscle we're going to have uh, ovoid nuclei, kind of larger, rounder nuclei that are going to be centrally placed. Lots and lots and lots of mitochondria uh, within cardiac muscle, within heart muscle, because of the need to continually generate uh, ATP. Um, and the mitochondria are going to be found scattered throughout the cell uh, often within lines or chains between the myofilaments themselves. Now, if we take a look at uh, the organization of the cardiac muscle, it's going to have dyads rather than triads. And the T-tubules, those extensions of the sarcoplasmic, I'm mean, sorry, the, uh, the uh, sarcolemma, the, the, the muscle membrane, uh, is still going to dive down into the cell. It's going to dive down at the Z-line uh, as opposed to the AI junction in skeletal muscle. It's going to happen at the Z-line in cardiac muscle. Uh, but the sarcoplasmic reticulum is less well organized because we're dealing with smaller cells. 
And so instead of a triad, we're going to have a dyad. So we're going to have one terminal cisternae of this sarcoplasmic reticulum and one T tube going to allow for uh, the integration of the contraction signal, the, the release of the calcium. Another identifying characteristic associated with cardiac muscle is going to be the intercalated disc. And this is going to be a specialized junctional complex of the cardiac muscle cells. So keep in mind that the cardiac muscle cells are individual cells. They're going to be coupled together into long fiber bundles. They can be branched. Uh, so we're going to get this kind of woven network. So it's going to be important that our cardiac muscle cells remain attached to their neighboring uh, muscle cells. You don't want the heart to contract and basically fall apart. And so if we take a look at this, we're going to see both fascia adherens and macula adherens, uh, both adherin type junctions, which can allow for anchoring one cardiac muscle cell to the next cardiac muscle cell. Uh, the fascia adherens, similar to the zonula adherens, anchoring to cytoskeletal elements, but in essence anchoring to the terminal sarcomeres. And so as the sarcomeres, those contractile elements within cardiac muscle contract, they're going to be pulling on these fascia adherents, and in doing so, they're going to be pulling on that neighboring cell. So as it contracts, it's going to be pulling the cell along with it, and pulling the neighboring cells along with it. Macula adherent desmosomes, again, very similar to what we've seen before, helping to anchor uh, these cells together. In addition to the adherence connections between a cardiac muscle, we're also going to have gap junctions. These are going to be important for electrically coupling these cells, uh, allowing ions to flow very rapidly through these cells so that we can spread that contraction signal very rapidly and allow for coordinated contraction of uh, cardiac muscle. Now, if we take a look at this uh, cardiac muscle, uh, again, individual cells, centrally placed nuclei, we're still going to have that cross striation pattern because the sarcomere is going to be lined up and almost like a crystalline uh, kind of repeated structure type uh, appearance. So we've got cross striations in both skeletal and cardiac muscle. Uh, the cells uh, are going to be hooked together uh, with these intercalated discs. They're going to be electrically coupled because of the presence of these gap junctions so that we can very rapidly send a signal along these muscle cells and allow for forceful coordinated contraction. Uh, as we're going to see in the circulatory system lecture, uh, cardiac muscle is going to be self-excitable. It means that it has the ability to cause its own contraction. It doesn't need external uh, stimulus to do that. And so it essentially causes itself to contract and then spreads uh, that electrical signal, that depolarization signal, that ion flow signal along its membrane through the gap junctions in the intercalated disc and allowing all of the cardiac muscle within a region to contract as one forceful coordinated unit. Uh, and so that's going to be important then for the organized coordinated contraction of the myocardium, the muscle layer uh, within the heart. The third of the muscle types, we had skeletal muscle as the first, cardiac muscle is the second. The third is going to be smooth muscle. And smooth muscle cells are going to be much, much smaller than both cardiac and skeletal muscle. They're going to be kind of spindle-shaped cells. So they're going to have kind of a, an enlarged center going down into very thin, kind of tapered regions towards the periphery, um, but looking almost like a, a little spindle, uh, if you can imagine that. Uh, it's going to have a single central-placed ovoid nucleus, and in many cases, you're not going to be able to see a whole lot uh, else that's going on, um, but the nucleus and then this circle of cytoplasm or this extension of cytoplasm uh, extending out. Now, these cells are going to be staggered together so that they come together as if you were packing uh, these spindle-shaped structures together. Each fiber is going to produce its own basal lamina. Uh, again, lots of proteoglycan and lots of type 3 collagen, which is going to allow it to have a relatively fine uh, extracellular matrix to hold these cells together. Now, smooth muscle is going to be smooth because it doesn't have a repeated striated pattern of these myofibrils. And so as opposed to the sarcomeres being staggered, or not staggered, stacked on top of one another in almost like a crystalline pattern, what we're going to have is that the myofilaments are going to be organized as almost a crisscross lattice, which are going to be going in multiple directions across the cytoplasm of the cell. 
And so we're still going to have the same sliding filament mechanism that we had in striated muscle. But what's going to happen is we're going to have these individual little uh, structures crisscrossing the cell that when it contracts, it's going to be causing contraction of the cell, not just along the long axis that we saw in, in skeletal muscle and essentially in cardiac muscle, but we're going to cause contraction in many different orientations within a single smooth muscle cell. And so we're going to condense it down and clutch it down from a variety of directions. Uh, again, we're going to look at the idea that calcium is going to be interacting with elements within uh, the cell to control muscle contraction. In this case, because it's a much smaller cell, uh, much slower contraction, as we're going to see in the next slide, it doesn't need the elaborate process of the dyads or triads that we had in cardiac or skeletal muscle. So calcium essentially goes through, interacts through calmodulin. Calmodulin is a calcium binding protein to phosphorylate myosin, and by phosphorylating myosin, it then allows the myosin and actin to bind. And it's only going to occur when calcium is present and when that phosphorylation uh, is occurring. And so that what happens then, again, we still got a sarcoplasmic reticulum, poorly organized, no T-tubules, no dyads, no triads. Um, so it's going to be a smaller size cell, much slower contraction. But again, we're still using calcium as the mechanism to control uh, muscle contraction. And so calcium binds to calmodulin, uh, causes uh, phosphorylation, energizing of the myosin head, and allowing for that interaction to occur. Again, if we take a look at the contraction, it's not just along the long axis of the cell. This entire cell is kind of condensing down. But then keep in mind that it's still anchored to the cytoskeleton. It's anchored to uh, the cell membrane so that when the cell contracts, it's going to be pulling in on its basal lamina. It's going to be controlling in on its co uh, connective tissue and basically pulling in on its neighboring cells. So if we take a look at this, the, swan, the smooth muscle cells are going to be overlapping. They're going to be attaching uh, to one another because their endometrial sheaths are going to be connected up with one another. Uh, lots of gap junctions within these cells so that as they contract, they're going to be triggering their neighboring cells to contract. Uh, and they often form uh, smaller, irregular fascicles. But when you take a look at this, it may be difficult to see these uh, as fascicles but they're often going to appear to be in layers. Uh, in this case, we're looking at a region where we've got longitudinal smooth muscle along the right-hand portion of this uh, figure, cross-sectional smooth muscle uh, on the left-hand portion, and so we've got these different layers that are going to be coming together. Uh, the nuclei uh, are going to be present, but they're not uh, kind of stacked on top of one another because of the staggered uh, way in which we're putting these spindle shells spindle-shaped cells together. Similarly, when we take a look in the cross-sectional profile, uh, we can see circular profiles, not all of which have nuclei. Again, because some of the circular profiles are going to represent a section through uh, the kind of center of the, the smooth muscle cell where the nuclei is present, some is going to be more towards the spindle-shaped kind of thinner regions where we just have the cytoplasm. Uh, smooth muscle, uh, like cardiac muscle, is going to be involuntary. Uh, it's going to be relatively slow contraction, which is controlled by both sympathetic and parasympathetic innervation. Uh, and we can find smooth muscle in a variety of locations. Uh, the previous slide showed it in uh, the walls of the digestive system. You can see it in the walls of the uterus. In this diagram, we're looking at it uh, within the wall of a blood vessel. So essentially, contraction of the smooth muscle will regulate the walls of a variety of organs within the body. If you have any questions, this finishes up uh, our series of lectures on uh, muscle. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to email me at hoffmanj at arcadia.edu. That finishes up our tissue types, and we're going to start to look into different systems within the body in the next series of lectures.